New Thinking Aloud is presented by the California Institute for Human Science, Mind Body Spirit University, a leader in fully accredited in person and online U.S. college degree programs in the topics we cover here. Visit their website at cihs.edu. Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the prehistoric origins in Black Africa of ancient Egyptian culture. My guest is Professor Thomas Brophy, who is the president of the California Institute of Human Science. He has authored several books on this subject, including The Origin Map, Prehistoric Megalithic Astrophysical Maps of the Universe, and two books co-authored with Robert Bouval, Black Genesis, The Prehistoric Origins of Ancient Egypt, and Imhotep the African, Architect of the Cosmos. He is also author of a wonderful book called The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism, Explorations of Spirit, Matter, and Physics. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. It's great to be here again. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, in your exploration of this particular topic, uh, began with uh, actual journeys into the uh, deep, barely explored, uh, remote parts of the Sahara Desert in in Egypt, some distance away from the Nile Valley. Yes. Uh, so. Parallel in Egypt, parallel to the Nile, it goes north and south, uh, and just uh, 100 kilometers or so uh, uh, west of that is a sequence of uh, oases. West of that, you have the desert, the Egyptian Sahara Desert, and uh, that goes uh, through uh, you know south to the Central Africa the Sahara Desert and the region in the southwest corner of Egypt where where Egypt meets Libya and uh, Sudan there is a uh, area called uh, Jebel Wainat and Gilf Kabir and to that region is uh, where I went with Robert Bouval on a uh, little expedition to study some very interesting recent finds uh, in this very remote region. It's it's four days by four-wheel drive jeep from the nearest uh, uh, house or inhabitant of any kind. And uh, it's an extremely remote region. Not even dirt roads, I gather. That's right. That's right. The, and there, it doesn't rain. <clears throat> so there, there are occasionally uh, jeeps like ours that go there. And so there's a kind of a... Uh, Jeep tracks in some places. Mm -hmm. but now, I understand that uh, archaeologists had assumed because the uh, air, the desert is so arid, I guess it, you said hadn't rained in thousands of years. Yeah, that area became hyper arid, extreme desert uh, 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 around 3400 BC. Mm -hmm. But before that, it, the climate was different. Yes. Yes, it was more moderate. There were seasonal rains, and uh, and at the site that I studied, the ancient site that I studied, Napta Playa, the, even that would fill up seasonally as a seasonal lake bed. We call it a playa. Mm -hmm. We call it playa now. Um, and, and as I understand it, uh, you found, for example, uh, uh, pa cave paintings and rock drawings showing giraffes and, and other animals, jungle animals uh, at one time were are depicted in the artwork. Yes, yeah, there are giraffes and animals like that depicted in the rock art. And uh, we uh, went there to visit a, uh, a beautifully painted prehistoric cave that uh, was discovered in that region uh, just 
discovered in 2007. We went there. We were the second group uh, to go there in 2008. We went with uh, the discoverer of the cave. It has on the ceiling very beautiful uh, prehistoric rock art depicting the people who lived there and their raising of cattle and various uh, domestic scenes and that sort of thing. We're talking about black Africans. Yes. Yes. In, in this area. As I understand it, Egyptian archaeologists have, and Egypt, Egyptologists have uh, largely suggested that the ancient Egyptian culture in, developed independently of black Africa. That's sort of the conventional <laughs> viewpoint. Yes, that's sort of the conventional view mm -hmm. that, that had been, uh, uh, that had been followed. Uh, and recently, though, it is changing because, as you mentioned, uh, related to the find of the uh, uh, art, the rock art in that region, uh, there was also found, actually by the same people, a, uh, a hieroglyph, a uh, hieroglyph uh, with a cartouche, the name of a, a Middle Kingdom king, Egyptian uh, pharaoh. And uh, that uh, really changed uh, ideas in this regard because the area is now and has been since 3000 BC, so extreme desert, uh, it was assumed there was no uh, travel to that area mm -hmm. from even, even uh, dynastic times of ancient Egypt. The commerce would have been impossible. Right. Mm -hmm. Be because of the climate, but now uh, the uh, hieroglyphic discoveries show that e Egyptians were able to travel that far themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, approach this as an astrophysicist. That's your background. You worked uh, for NASA, as I recall, on the Voyager 2 project. That's right. Yeah, it was wonderful working. We, the, the team I did my doctoral dissertation with uh, had an instrument on board the Voyager 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, project. So, uh, at one of these locations, you described the Napta Playa, where, uh, which became a, a lake bed filled partially during the year. Yeah, seasonal lake. Seasonal lake, where uh, there were discovered there, and you personally went to study uh, megalithic structures, uh, very ancient, uh, prehistoric, that had uh, archaeo-astronomical significance. Yes. Yes. I went there to uh, uh, study them and uh, measure them, uh, because the initial report... Uh, had some things that didn't add up in the data that uh, of where the where these large stones that were reported to uh, align with stars, uh, they as to their locations and which stars they aligned with, there were some discrepancies there. So one of the things I wanted to do was to uh, measure the actual locations myself with a little handheld GPS, mm -hmm. and I happily I was able to uh, get there. With, Tag along with a kind of a uh, remote, uh, a remote uh, adventure travel group, uh, just two jeeps that were going through the region, and uh, I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what you learned. Uh, so, I studied. I got the measures of the locations of these uh, megalithic stones, and studied the alignment of them with stars and how. They aligned with particular stars as they moved through the procession of the equinox. Um, Let's define for our viewers now. Not everyone will understand the procession of the equinoxes, which is very important for uh, archaeo uh, astronomy. Yes, uh, because the Earth's or, uh, spin axis, uh, you know, the Earth spins on its axis every 24 hours. The North Pole that the spins around, the Earth spins around, it, uh, rotates, it wobbles on a cycle of about 26,000 years. So it points at a different location in the sky, uh, as it moves through that whole cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's called the precession of the equinoxes. And because of that motion, uh, the, the apparent location of stars, uh, in the sky relative to Earth 
change over that same cycle. And that's what gives us uh, what we call in the West uh, the zodiac ages, like mm -hmm. the age of Aquarius and the age of Pisces. And the age of Taurus, yeah. the age of Aries preceding. Uh, as I understand it, uh, astrologically speaking, these ages have to do with the uh, constellation that's on the horizon at the moment of the spring equinox. Yes, it's the constellation that the sun is in mm -hmm. at the moment of the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and, and that is going to every two, 2,500, 2,600 years or so, uh, that changes. Yeah, it's, it's constantly moving. So, so you just divide the 26,000 by 12 and you get about 2,400 years mm -hmm. that, uh, it move, the, the location of the apparent location of the sun moves through those different zodiac constellations. Mm -hmm. And this was understood by, at, le at least by the ancient Greeks, probably by the ancient Persians, but uh, maybe the ancient Sumerians who were uh, students of astrology. But your findings suggest, if I understand it, that the procession of the equinoxes was understood by these prehistoric uh, people in black Africa who created these particular megaliths, uh, uh, like an astronomical calendar, sometimes called the uh, Stonehenge of the Sahara. Yes, uh, the Naptoplia find was announced uh, by CNN as the Stonehenge of the Sahara. And uh, it's a fascinating site. It does have megaliths. And uh, however, the, the calendar circle that uh, got a lot of attention uh, was composed of, is composed of uh, smaller stones that come up to about your knee. But they are in, they, that forms a very interesting calendar circle, which has a astro astronomical meaning. Uh, and that calendar circle is in the complex of uh, megalithic large stone uh, structures and alignments as well. Mm -hmm. now, do we know anything at all about the people who created these structures? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we know they were black African uh, people. Their remains are uh, studied anthropologically and they were the people uh, inhabiting the region of, of the time. Mm -hmm. I understand that they also seem to have uh, some sort of religious cult involving uh, uh, the ceremonial um, rituals uh, that had to do with the uh, the cow. The cow was very important to them. Yes, uh, the cattle cult and uh, the uh, the uh, serious and uh, the cattle iconography was very important to them uh, as well as uh, in uh, ancient Egypt, which came later, yeah. ancient Egyptian civilization. And at Nepta Playa, there were not found any uh, graves of humans. No human uh, kings or leaders' uh, graves were found, but a very finely uh, constructed grave of a cow was mm -hmm. found. Um, which is so something similar to uh, what you will find in ancient Egypt. Yes. Where, like the Serapium, where there's a, a whole large, enormous complex with uh, emba embalmed bulls. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, so there are many elements, clearly, of the culture that was operating at Nabta Playa in the earlier time that moved to the Nile Valley and uh, became the uh, ancient Egyptian dynastic civilization. And uh, one of the Important correlations is the which you, as an astrophysicist uh, studying archaeoastronomy, uh, pay attention to is similar alignments found in uh, the uh, Giza plateau where the great pyramids are. Yeah, similar astronomy, uh, similar astronomical functioning of the monuments. Uh, like a very clear one is uh, and, and easy to understand is that in ancient Egypt, uh, the new year was heralded by the heliacal rising of Sirius. Now, it's a big word, but all that means is the first sighting of the star Sirius uh, of the year just before, um, just before sunrise. So that heliacal means rising before the sun. And so stars go through a cycle where they disappear 
because they're too close to the sun, you can't see them, and then they reappear just before dawn. It's called the Heliacal Rising. So in ancient Egypt, uh, the Heliacal Rising of C Sirius heralded the uh, timing of the, uh, the floods, the Nile flooding from the monsoon rains that well, they didn't know that necessarily that the monsoon rains were, were south and flooding the Nile, but mm -hmm. the Nile flooded every year at about the same time, just after the Heliacal rising of Sirius. Mm -hmm. So there, there were monuments, uh, uh, temples in, uh, uh, Old Kingdom Egypt that, that were rebuilt to track the rising of Sirius as it moved with their alignment of the temples was rebuilt to track the rising of Sirius as it moved through precession motion. And we found the same thing at Nabta Playa. These uh, megalithic stone alignments, they tracked the rising of Sirius and other stars uh, uh, as they moved through precession. Mm -hmm. And uh, the heliacal rising of Sirius at Nabta Playa was, uh, it had these dual alignments where they put uh, megalithic stone alignment to towards the north that would track a line with a circumpolar star. Uh, we call it the Big Dipper. The ancient Egyptians call it the Bull's Thigh constellation, the stars that go around the, the North Pole star at the same time that the uh, uh, star Sirius rose in the east, mm -hmm. the heliacal rising. And so for the ancient, uh, the Napta Playa people, they were clearly tracking the same stars and probably for the same reason. Because, like, it was a seasonal lake, Napta Playa was. Well, these monsoon rains uh, filled up the, the lake seasonally at the same time, about the same time of year. So they would have naturally wanted to mm -hmm. track their calendar, uh, the same events astronomically uh, with the same stars as we can see that they did with these large stone alignments. Mm -hmm. And then at about 3500 BC, the monsoon rains pattern moved further south. So Nabta Playa region became extreme desert and had to be abandoned. And, uh, that's when the same, the culture, the ancient Egyptian, uh, dynastic cult culture that shows many of the same elements pops up in the Nile Valley. So you're suggesting maybe these people migrated north? Yes. Yes. Or their culture did mm -hmm. and them. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, really, really, um, uh, east to the Nile Valley. Mm hmm. East and north. East and north. Yeah. I, I see. So, today in Egypt, uh, the archaeologists uh, often refer to, and, I, and I've been there, uh, to connections between ancient Egyptian culture and the Sumerian culture and the Crete culture and the Persian culture. Uh, Yet when you visit Egypt, especially uh, around the Aswan in the southern uh, part of the Nile, you see uh, uh, mostly black people. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we know from the anthropological evidence that the people uh, just predating the uh, dynastic civilization in the, Na in the Nabta Playa region we're, we're black, uh, black mm -hmm. African people. I, I mean, it's a s significant discovery, I would think, because, uh, amongst other things, the, these black people had a very sophisticated understanding of astronomy. It looks like that. There, yes, there's, uh, suggestions of that mm -hmm. in, in the ancient, uh, site of Napta Playa and elsewhere. And, and, uh, it took a while, as I understand it, for conventional Egyptologists to acknowledge, uh, any of the archaeo astronomy, you know, the correlations found by some of your colleagues. Yes. Yes. Like, um, like the Orion correlation of the Great Pyramids with the stars of Orion's belt. It's still controversial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you found a, a co correlations with Orion at Napta Playa. Yes, with the stars of Orion's belt and uh, the Orion constellation at Nebta Playa. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes, so there's this there's this very clear link uh, from the astronomy at Nebta Playa at around the time 4000 BC that the culture moved to the Nile Valley. And also Nebta Playa as a site is much more ancient as well. Mm -hmm. There's ra radiocarbon dating going back to around 9000 BC at Nabta Playa. 
And there's also uh, astronomical evidence of astronomical alignments that go back in, in uh, further in time as well. And uh, like the calendar circle that made the site famous, uh, uh, it has uh, is it uh, s probably represents uh, the stars of Orion's belt at the uh, uh, spring equinox hill their spring equinox heliacal rising around six thousand BC, and it's a nice little guy diagram that demonstrates how they were seen in the sky and their location in the sky as well as the timing with the summer solstice of them rising. Demonstrated in this calendar circle diagram that I suggest also was a sort of a teaching diagram that demonstrated the uh, precession motion of the sky, the long-term precession motion. Well, it's very interesting that a pre-literate culture, as far as we know, there was certainly no written language at, at that time, could develop uh, advanced ideas of uh, astronomy. Yes. Yes, if they had this advanced knowledge, uh, it's mysterious. Uh, you know, you, you, you could speculate basically three basic type, basic ways that they could have gotten this knowledge. Okay, suppose they had advanced knowledge of astronomy, as their suggestions that they might have had in the monuments. Uh, how did they get that knowledge? How did they know that? Uh, basically three types. They, some other group or beings told them or gave them the knowledge, mm -hmm. or they could have had the knowledge passed down to them from a much more ancient, maybe high civilization mm -hmm. of the past, or they could have gotten the knowledge through uh, other types of means, like intuitive means or paranormal, parapsychological mm -hmm. methods. So, to, to summarize it maybe in more popular language, we're talking about ancient aliens on the one hand, or an ancient breakaway civilization, uh, or uh, remote viewing. Yes. Would, are three, three possibilities, and I'm sure there are advocates for each of those. Yes. Yep. There are... Uh, uh, Advocates for each of those that mm -hmm. like to connect with my work on the uh, ancient monuments yeah. astronomy. Now, but you, having been a NASA scientist, uh, didn't go down there with an agenda of, of any kind, to, to my understanding. No, I, I saw it as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. As a puzzle. So the, the first, uh, the first uh, technical archaeological report of the site uh, mentioned the alignment that these stones were probably, these megalithic stones were probably aligned with stars. And it mentioned, and it mentioned the data for the location of the stones. And uh, as I said, I found there's some discrepancies there. So I was just very interested in it as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. So I studied the site. I went there and I studied it as a, uh, as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. You, you weren't concerned about uh, any of the political controversies concerning the origins of ancient Egyptian culture? That's right. Uh -huh. uh, I, w I was not at the time con concerned with that. And after I published the, the one book, the, um, the Origin Map, I was uh, actually a little surprised that some of the most enthusiastic response I got was from uh, uh, black African scholars and because uh, they saw the importance of that for connecting the ancient Egyptian civilization with uh, uh, black African origins. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even thinking of that when I studied the site, yeah. but I was happy that uh, it came out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, it, it, uh, when I read uh, the book you co-authored with Robert Bouval, um, Black Genesis, Yes. Um, he he described two you could call them academic camps the afrocentric and the eurocentric camp in terms of the origin of egyptian culture and he said neither one is is being scientific if they're arguing for a political viewpoint and just trying to muster the evidence uh, that supports their viewpoint and ignoring the other evidence that uh, your interest in going there was just to look at the data and see where it led Yes, yes. I, I like to follow the evidence. And to me, I, I knew, I thought of it as a human, uh, ancient human 
project. Yeah. I, but it just, I didn't care about which race of humans it was mm-hmm. at the time. But you did point out that uh, Egyptian guidebooks that were popular uh, had some very racist descriptions about uh, the, the attitude of Egyptians toward different racial groups. Yes, you'll see uh, even in, in uh, current guidebooks, probably a kind of a hierarchical description of the of, uh, of the views of the races, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and so many Egyptians today who probably think of themselves primarily as Mediterranean people, uh, even though they're on the African continent, uh, look down at the idea that their very powerful ancient culture might have emerged out of black Africa. Yeah, and it's, it's clearly obviously a modern uh, ethnic view or ethnic mindset mm-hmm. that that leads to that kind of thinking it not any evidence from ancient history mm-hmm. I think. so also as a uh, astrophysicist you began to look more deeply at what these calendars and megaliths might be pointing to in addition to s- some of the obvious uh, correlations having to do with uh, you know the spring equinox and the uh, constellation Orion and, and the star Sirius. As, as I understand it, you found a number of other uh, correlations that uh, would seem almost impossible for ancient people to have uh, come up with. Yes. Uh, so as studying uh, the site and looking at it as like a puzzle, an astronomical puzzle, uh, uh, I found a series of uh, correlations, and the uh, sort of most prosaic ones, like I just mentioned about the alignment with the rising of Sirius and the circumpolar stars, those are now accepted by the conventional archaeological anthropological community. Mm-hmm. Then there's more that go on from there, and the site itself is much more ancient. So it became hyper arid around 3500 BC and it was abandoned. But it was, uh, there's radiocarbon dates going back to about 9000 BC. And there's also, uh, so, and there's also evidence, there's other evidence that the monuments were, were being built and maintained over those thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Some of the megalithic stones uh, are polished and uh, even appear to be sculptures. Yes. At the, uh, there's sort of a centerpiece of the Napta Playa complex uh, that uh, just got the name Complex Structure A, mm-hmm. and it's at the center. So the the large stones arranged in lines that point to stars, uh, all these lines of megalithic stones radiate out from one point, like a hub. That's Complex Structure A. And Complex Structure A is in uh, a field of uh, many other complex structures. And they're called complex structures because they're built on, remember, it's a playa. It's a seasonal lake. So uh, over the seasons, over thousands of years, the sediments built up in the lake. And and, uh, it's only a seasonal lake, so half the year it's dry and part of the year it's wet. Uh, and so these sediments are known to have built up over thousands of years, 9,000 BC to 4,000 BC. And these complex structures are built in those sediments. Mm-hmm. And they, they include, so at the bottom of the sediments is the bedrock or the, the rock bottom of the playa. And, uh, in each of these complex structures, at the bottom of the structure, underneath all the sand, the playa sediments, on the bedrock, there's a sculpted lump of stone, a sculpture. And so at complex structure A, there was a, at the bottom the sculpted lump of stone, and then chalked in place on top of that was uh, this s- s- polished sculpture, geometric strange sculpture that you mentioned. At the time it was discovered, it was thought of as the earliest uh, megalithic sculpture uh, known. And then, uh, so... That was placed there, and then the sediments were put back in, and on top of all that, there was a, a megalithic uh, surface structure, mm-hmm. so this complex structure. Mm-hmm. So, it would appear that, uh, based, based on this observation, that this area was inhabited over a period of maybe 5,000 years, from 9,000 B.C. to 4,000 B.C., that's right. That's right. And these sediments were building up, and these uh, structures were being maintained. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, so, when the, when these complex structures were found, the initial hypothesis was 
that they were all created uh, near the time, the, the late period, uh, late megalithic period, just before the site was abandoned. And uh, so it was hypothesized. So this was after all the sediments were laid down, the sand was already there, that the uh, people at that time, they somehow, they somehow knew where there were lumps at the bottom of the sediments underneath. Mm -hmm. They dug, dug a hole and sculpted the lump on the bedrock of stone and then uh, filled the sand back in and put the megalithic sculptures on top. Oh. And uh, that was considered, uh, actually I suggested that that was kind of a convoluted explanation. A simpler explanation could be that the, the bedrock sculptures that are on the sediments, uh, underneath the sediments, were sculpted uh, before the sediments were there. Yeah. And they were maintained over the millennia as important uh, monuments. Uh, and what we find now, these complex sculptures, are the maintenance of those over the uh, millennia. Mm -hmm. So a culture that had some sort of stable community for thousands of years uh, could well be equipped to uh, gain knowledge of the procession of the equinoxes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And But you learned uh, through your observations or you hypothesized that their astronomical knowledge could be far more detailed than just that. That's right. Uh, I, I found correlations that suggested that. The distance at which the uh, megalithic stones that point to particular stars, like of Orion's belt, the distance on the ground could be correlated, the relative distance on the ground of the lines could be correlated with the relative distance to the actual stars to in the, the sky. the distance to the stars. Yeah, now that's kind of a crazy idea, but there's this this correlation there. Now, and you looked at this with the precision of an astrophysicist. Yes. Yeah. And and you have, a, uh, as you've explained it to me, some of the measurements you have more confidence in than others, but overall, you feel pretty confident about this. The the basic alignments and the uh, the that they did track char the char stars as they m moved through precession. Yeah, that's that's really pretty well accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, the explanation that that the uh, the bedrock sculptures were probably older than the early hypothesis, even that was uh, uh, accepted or came around to that view by the uh, the. Uh, the uh, uh, anthropological, archaeological team that's an official excavator of natural planet. Well, it's understandable that conventional uh, astronomers and archaeologists and archaeoastronomers and Egyptologists are going to balk at the idea that some preliterate African people could measure the distance from the Earth to different stars. That, that requires today to do that sophisticated equipment. That's right. That's right. So that's, and, and the, uh, that stone sculpture in the center of complex structure A mm -hmm. that had the interesting geometric shape and the outer edge of it, uh, was reported to be found as like polished, a polished mm -hmm. surface. Yeah. And you can see from the images, if you measure them, that it was in a, like a spherical, uh, a very, uh, finely made spherical section. And it was chalked in place on top of the bedrock sculpture. And uh, uh, I found that it basically uh, uh, subtended and maybe demonstrated the apparent motion of the center of the galaxy as it moved through precession as well as the stars. And so that's, that brings up another problem if, if you think that might have been what the people were tracking uh, because the center of the galaxy is not a visual object. It's not a visual sky object. But other, other ancient cultures uh, we know uh, have have held important astronomical importance through visual astronomy to the center of the galaxy for other reasons too. Yeah. You you can kind of see where it is even though you don't see any bright star there but so that's I I make that suggestion in the book as well and the bedrock sculpture that's at the center there mm -hmm. underneath all the sediments uh, and that the stone was the sculpture was placed on top of uh it, I suggest, uh, it looks like a map of the galaxy itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the excavators of the site, they, you know, made a map and a drawing of this find and the way that they placed the center of the drawing being the center of all these alignments, uh, was measured at a location on the, uh, sculpture, 
uh, which would be consistent if you thought of it as a sculpture of the galaxy of where the sun and earth happen to be in, in the galaxy. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but as I recall, you went even further than that. Yes. No. You talked about the velocity of uh, stars as, as they you know, move. Yes. So I just, I just kept take, finding these correlations uh, as a puzzle. I uh, just kept taking uh, that that further. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people might say, well, there's so many different numbers and you're putting it all together. There's a risk that maybe you're projecting some some ideas uh, on onto a, a random pattern. Yeah, yeah, I understand that that uh, that criticism, and this is a puzzle. It's uh, a description of correlations that mm -hmm. I found there. People, people and can uh, look. I mean, not everybody can go and do the actual measurements, but that's what you did. Yes, yeah, yeah. So this the correlations, the existence of the correlations is not proof that that's what. The builders of the stones uh, intended, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with the uh, the alignment of the helical rising of Sirius that we found moved in the same alignments being tracked in uh, the uh, Old Kingdom Egypt, that's additional cultural evidence that that's what was really meant by yeah. those stone alignments. Mm -hmm. For these other sort of more extreme uh, correlations. We don't have that kind of additional cultural evidence that that's what was really meant. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was, I got really intrigued by the bedrock sculptures that, that are much more ancient. I got my colleague from when I was doing planetary science to uh, get interested in this because uh, we tried to get access to uh, remote sensing data that could see under the uh, sand to see if this Maybe this whole Playa Basin bedrock has a sculpted meaning, uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have the data yet, uh, uh, high enough resolution to be able to see yeah. underneath the sands what's really there. Mm -hmm. In other words, the uh, investigations are continuing. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so to summarize, you found some very important correlations between some of the basic Obvious, well acknowledged astrological, uh, not astro, well, astrological and astronomical mm -hmm. uh, correlations between these uh, megaliths and the uh, calendar stones at Napta Playa and uh, elsewhere in, in, in the Sahara as well. You mentioned uh, yes. the Bagnol uh, calendar. Yeah. Uh, Bagnol Circle is even more remote. It's out in that Jebel Iwana region that I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, near, near the, um, uh, uh, near Libya. Hundreds of kilometers <laughs> further into the desert. Yes, much more remote. And, uh, we, it's named after Ralph Bagnold, who was a physicist, uh, enlisted by the British, uh, at around the time of World War II for something called the Long Range Desert Expedition, where, for military reasons, they were exploring this area of North Africa. And, uh, he stumbled on this very ancient circle. It's now called Bagnold Circle, and uh, it's in, it's in such a remote region that uh, it had not been formally at the time that we visited in two thousand eight. It had not been formally visited by any archaeologists. You were the first person to make precise measurements. Yes, it hadn't even been measured precisely which way is north and south on the circle. There and was, uh, as I recall, it very much resembled the calendar stones at Napta Playa. Yes, stones of uh, Bagnol Circle is about, are about the same size. They come up to about your knee. And Bagnol Circle is about twice as big as the, the, the Napta Playa Circle. But it, there's a lot of resemblances and, uh, we found uh, some uh, sort of obvious simple astronomy in Bagnold Circle, simple astronomy, at least in Bagnold Circle, with like uh, the north south, the north stones, the north south aligned uh, stones in a circle uh, colored black and the east west colored white. And so it's, there's clearly at least some basic astronomical meaning in Bagnold Circle as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, another point I, I think it's worth bringing up, you mentioned the significance of the star Sirius 
both to the ancient Egyptians and to the people at Napta Playa, having to do with the monsoon rains and, and signifying very important meteorological, uh, ecological events for, for these people. There's another book I'm aware of by Robert Temple called The Serious Mystery, in which he looks at the Dogon people, um, who I think are in sub-Saharan Africa, who they call themselves, I think, the people of the dog uh, star, because they, they regard Sirius as uh, where their ancestors came from. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that, that's more connection with the possibility that uh, the uh, roots of the uh, dynastic Egyptian civilization culture came from like North Central Africa. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the line from like Giza to the Cartouche and the Why Not, mm -hmm. uh, just keep going, you get to like Central Africa, that region. You co-authored uh, two books with Robert Bouval. He's also well known, as I understand it, for for the Orion correlations at the Giza Plateau. You, you also have an introduction by Robert Schock, a geologist who has argued very strongly that the Sphinx is much older than had previously been thought, that it's weathered by water damage, which suggests that it was, uh, and I've been there, you can see it. It's, it, it's plain to the eye. It looks like water damage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the Sphinx, uh, which would have had to have occurred prior to 3000 BC. Geophysically, it uh, is probably r weathering uh, from running water mm -hmm. on the Giza Plateau that made the weathering patterns that we see on, on the Sphinx enclosure. And uh, that you could just combine that with paleoclimatology. And that means that, uh, that if, if it is water, running water weathering, it had to have been, uh, at the time when there was rains, mm -hmm. uh, heavy rains. And that was, uh, uh, more than 5,000 BC, I think yeah. is, is where Shock dates it. And that's why, uh, he, he, Shock was also very interested in Napta Playa because it was around, uh, that dates to around, you know, 6,000 BC as well. Now, another point in, in the book African Genesis is, is that if you look carefully at the face of the Sphinx, it does seem to uh, suggest the face of a black African. That's right. There's another you know, point, too. Yes. Another, another point of, of resemblance. I think it's fair to say, as a scholar, that uh, you're... You're not an Afrocentrist. You're not trying to argue one way or the other. You're, you're showing this is the evidence we found. And uh, it may take scholars a long time to decipher all of these mysteries. There are, there are many other mysteries associated with ancient cultures and new discoveries all the time, that you, such as you pointed out at Gobleki Tepe in Turkey. Yes. Uh, after I studied no, uh, Napta Playa, you know, there was the very, there is the very recent discovery at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which site is even older. I think it dates back to 10 to 12,000 BC. No. And it's large stone megalithic that is another game changer as far as the standard understanding of ancient, ancient civilization. When I grew up and went to school, it, it was thought that, you know, the earliest civilizations were in Samaria. Yes. Uh, and that that's now all being challenged, and I suppose it's reasonable to expect that there will be future discoveries as well. Yeah, and so the redating of the Sphinx through the geophysical weathering, uh, one of the resistances to that when it initially came out was, well, there was nothing else that old, so it couldn't be that old. Mm -hmm. but then we found Napta Playa and now Gobekli Tepe and other places, and so that reasoning has just gone away. There were prehistoric cultures, we call them prehistoric, which may <laughs> means they're not part of our current history, I yeah. guess. But you've also pointed out uh, that there are scripts that have yet to be deciphered. These people may well have had a written language. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of engraved art, and there are some engraved that clearly look like, they look to me like sort of like Linear A, which is another undeciphered script in that region. Yes. 
I see. Well, this is a fascinating exploration. I should just say before we close our discussion, you also make a point of the possibility of anomalous cognition or remote viewing as as a tool that these ancient people had mastered. And uh, with regard to their knowledge of the center of the galaxy, you refer to some interesting research by a parapsychologist, James Spottiswood, who uh, did correlations of, of remote viewing and uh, I've spoken to Spottiswood about it. He himself isn't certain whether this is a replicable finding, but it it would seem as if at 13 hours and 30 minutes of local sidereal time, remote viewing is greatly enhanced. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what I understand, Spottiswood and Spottiswood and May, actually, yes. you mentioned Ed May, mm -hmm. uh, did uh, was they did a meta-analysis of all the good uh, a meta analysis of all the good anomalous cognition experiments mm -hmm. and uh, they were looking for uh, correlations f looking for if there was something like a time of day yeah. or a time of year when uh, the when when the experiments got good results mm -hmm. or, or positive results and they couldn't find anything until finally they looked uh, according to a sidereal time mm -hmm. and they found a very strong peak the very strong peak at at, at that at time. a particular time, yeah. yeah. Sidereal time is time with respect to the stars. The center of galaxy is essentially a star. It's a location in the sky that moves with the same time as the stars. It turns out thirteen thirty sidereal time is roughly when the center of galaxy rises above the horizon. I speculate hmm, maybe there's maybe there's some connection there to our anomalous cognition capacity to the center of the galaxy. And to a sensitivity uh, regarding the center of the galaxy. Some kind of, ho some yeah. kind of connection. Mm -hmm. And who knows, if you push it a little farther, okay, what, it, what is at the center of the galaxy? We know now there's a supermassive black hole there. Yeah. Right? And, uh, so what is a black hole? A black hole is a, it's a singularity in space and time. What are the reports of the deepest phases of meditation like? They say, well, you go into a state of experience that's, that's beyond space and time. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, this is just a correlation at yeah. this point. Uh, it's, it's not a physical mechanism correlation, but there's something interesting there. And there's mm -hmm. another little interesting bit there, too. <laughs> We're going to take this further. The center of galaxy is about, about uh, 25,000 light years away. Almost the same duration as Procession of the Equinox. Mm. <laughs> so there's an interesting uh, correlation there, too. I see. Well, we're at a level now where all we can do is speculate. Yeah, on this stuff, yes. Yeah. yeah. But it is fascinating. Yeah. And uh, I think speculation uh, can be healthy if you take it uh, lightly. Don't get overly hung up on your speculations. Mm -hmm. And I think there's nothing wrong with speculating. And, and surely in this area, there are going to be a lot of speculations. But what you've explained to me now is that the larger community of archaeologists and archaeoastronomers uh, are, are now coming to uh, an, an acceptance of the correlation, for example, of the uh, Giza pyramids with the belt of Orion. I think there's, there's gradually more acceptance of that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's been more acceptance that more ancient than was assumed, people did track the uh, procession of the equinox. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very significant work. I'm happy to share it with our viewers. Thomas Brophy, thank you so much for being with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. in the new Thinking Aloud Dialogue series is UFOs and UAP, Are We Really Alone? Now available on Amazon. You can now download a PDF copy or order a beautiful printed copy of Issue 6 of the new Thinking Aloud magazine.